So everyone is welcome also to pick up any of the literature we have back there. We've always got our newspapers. Please take a look. Um, you can also, of course, subscribe. Um, and at certain levels of subscription, you also can get someone who is incarcerated a subscription to the paper. I think something like one third of our subscribers are incarcerated. So please consider donating or subscribing to our paper. Um, but we have the latest issue back there. Okay, we're going to start the live stream. Uh, hi, we would like to welcome everyone tonight to the Workers' World Public Forum, Deportation, Exploitation, and Super Exploitation. Uh, my name is Al, and I'm going to be chairing the meeting. So, uh, <laughs> wow, y'all are way too <laughs> So we've got three great speakers tonight. Um, our first um, is Kayla Papachet, very fun last name, um, and they're going to discuss uh, the ICE raids on, Im in, on immigrant communities, and they have a lovely slideshow prepared for us. So give a hand to Kayla. Hello. Uh, my name is Kayla. I am from Long Island. I've lived there for 14 years of my life. So I'm going to talk to you about what's going on over there with ICE. So just 30 minutes outside to the east of this bustling city of noise is Long Island, home to 7 million people. There are two counties, Nassau and Suffolk, that are dominated by a white bourgeois, which come as no surprise to those who understand Long Island's racist and classist origins. But the poor and the marginalized groups of our island have long been redlined into underdeveloped hamlets. Crippled by our lack of quality education, public transportation, job opportunities, all of the consequences the exploited are forced to bear under capitalism. Long Island is also home to millions of immigrants, many of whom are undocumented. Outside of New York City, Long Island has the largest population of immigrants in the state. Since the influx of immigrants on the island, police commissioners in Nassau and Suffolk County have been working with ICE. Here's how they do it. They police immigrant communities, preying on gas stations, supermarkets, laundromats, home depots, the Long Island Railroad stations, bus stops and terminals. They seek out and stop people of color and ask them for documentation. They tra then transfer this over to ICE. That's how Dennis Guerra, a Long Island resident, found himself being deported to El Salvador this past summer, this past November, for failing to signal while changing lanes. He was driving. Fortunately, an immigrant's rights group, Garrison, located in Nassau's immigrant hub, Hempstead Village, has filed a lawsuit against Nassau County as it is illegal to work in cahoots with ICE. But we know that at the end of the day, all these laws were created and will be mended to uphold a white supremacist power structure. ICE in Long Island has also been carrying out a plan called Operation Secure Streets, an initiative to gain intelligence and deport undocumented immigrants that have had a history of driving under the influence. But we know that this plan also includes migrant workers, nurses, students, people with traffic violations, people who jaywalk, people who are loitering or looking for work, and people who just have the misfortune of running into a white supremacist on Long Island, and that's not hard to do, uh, that will report them. It includes people who fit the nonsense of, of uh, pull yourself up by the bootstraps rhetoric, like Orlando Garcia. He was a Salvadorian immigrant in the Brentwood who went from working in a factory to owning his own taxi company. Let's not forget that this country was built on the enslavement of African people and the genocide of indigenous people. These white supremacists have no right to dictate who can and cannot come onto the land that their ancestors stole. It's not their jurisdiction. Uh, I find importance in bringing up injustices on Long Island immigrants that we're crippled by because of there's a lack of efforts around organizing for justice especially with a Marxist perspective on Long Island. Our island is painted as one of the richest places in the state, which is true, but there is enormous presence of people of color. We are just in small, low-income hamlets, surrounded by mansions that belong to the people that keep us in poverty. 
slideshow. Your slideshow is that. Uh, yeah. I didn't want to interrupt you. Sorry, can you see that? I don't know if you can. Oh, okay. Just, just you can click later on. Click later. Yeah. You got it. You got it. You got it. Oh. Bing. Our politicians use the MS-13 deaths in Brentwood as an excuse to target and harass undocumented Salvadorian immigrants. We know MS-13 began in LA, not El Salvador, and we know that it is not the wealthy white folk in Patchogue, East Islip, or Selden being targeted by MS-13 gang violence. It's the very same black and brown low-income people in Brentwood, Deer Park, Wyandanche, and Bay Shore that are being targeted. We also know the causes of gangs begin from xenophobic capitalist spaces. We know the answer is not policing. It's what makes the situation worse. Both our Democratic and Republican candidates for the Nassau County executive seat this past November argued who was going to be harder on immigrants and make sure that Nassau will not be a sanctuary state. They used phrases like, Nassau is becoming the sixth borough of New York City, to instill fears in the residents of becoming like the other. So I know that a lot of you have a predisposition to think of Long Island as a wealthy suburban area, but not most of us live in small communities where we're clustered and we're all very low income. My town alone, my hamlet, is Elmont, which is a predominantly Haitian and uh, Guyanese population. Very few white people. <laughs> um, and there are a few organizations on Long Island that do work around immigrants' rights but many of their answers begin and end with the polls. We know that this is not the answer. We know the elections are just another bourgeois garbage. Well, well that's what I've got for you tonight. Thank you for listening to me. You're all too kind. Thank you so much, Kayla. That was awesome. Very awesome. All right. So our next speaker this evening is Sophia Adams. Uh, they're talking about the ICE detention centers tonight. Thank you. Like Al said, I'm going to be speaking on ICE detention centers. And first I'm going to talk a little bit about a specific detention center that's in Dilly, Texas. Um, lawyers that go to it, they call it baby jail. It is a place where women and children are, he are held. Um, men, when they're crossing the border, they're split from their families. Um, and men and boys over 18 are taken into separate facilities. And so Dilly is one exclusively for women and children. Um, when you walk in, there's a room called the Yelera, it's called the fridge, um, and people are always sick. There's very limited health care, there's not enough doctors, there's not enough nurses, and there's enough medication for the people that do get seen. So women are often just seen help holding their sick children. Um, and the average stay is about three weeks. If you're there for four to five weeks, you usually get transferred to Burke Detention Center, which is in Pennsylvania. Um, and people will stay there for months, sometimes years. There's children who are in there right now that have had at least two birthdays in there. Um, there was recently a lawsuit that went through uh, to ch challenge child detentions. Um, and the outcome was that it's illegal to hold children for over 21 days. So you can legally hold a child up for um, three weeks, but obviously this is violated all the time. Um, sometimes they say it's so that parents and children can stay together, so if the mom is staying longer, they'll say that that's why the child is staying, but really it should be the other way around, that both of them get released at the same time. Um, there's also a big issue where people who get their paperwork that goes through, sometimes they're still not released. So lawyers will go through all of the documents and they'll see that this person should have been released, but for some reason they're still in in the detention center, and so they'll have to go through another legal process of trying to get them out and figuring out how they fell through the cracks and why they fell through the cracks. Uh, there's really no justification for detaining, detaining a two-year-old, a five-year-old. There's no justification for detaining any of these people. Um, there aren't individual findings for anyone in Dili and why they should be there. The only reason they're there is purely because they crossed the border without documentation and were caught. 
Um, most of these people who are crossing the border are crossing to try and get asylum. They're fleeing poverty and violence, often in South America, and we know that this poverty and violence is caused by the U.S. Asylum cases are very strange because they require you to be physically in the U.S., but you can't have documents already. So there is no other way other than to come and cross without papers. If someone does get a visa, which can take years and years and is a very difficult process, if you do get a visa and you come and once you're inside you try to apply for asylum, you um, can be charged with visa fraud. Um, you also, if that doesn't happen, the, the criteria for getting a visa and how you were approved, that's going to be grounds for um, your asylum case not to be approved. Um, so the, the system is really rigged on every single level. Um, and detention centers are a horrifically perfect place for labor super exploitation. The women that, work at, or that live at Delhi, they aren't working, but Core Civic, which is the corporation that runs for-profit prisons and detention centers, um, they get paid by how many beds they have. So Delhi has 2,400 beds. Right now there's only 500 people in there, which is good compared to how many there could be in there, but um, Core Civic still gets paid on the number of beds, not based on how many people are there. Um, so really it's just an incentive for them to keep building and building more prisons and detention centers regardless of how many people are in them. Uh, last fall, there was a proposal for four to five more um, detention centers to be built. One of them actually very near where I grew up. Um, and often these detention centers and prisons as well will appeal to communities saying that they will bring jobs if they're allowed to build their detention centers there. But really all they do is bring fear for immigrant communities and push confidence for white supremacists in the area. Uh, in most other detention centers, ones that are predominantly men, prisoners are forced to work. There's one in Aurora, Colorado, a detention center, where prisoners were forced to clean, maintain, and operate a 1,500-bed facility. And GEO, is, which is an organization like Core Civic, pays them $1 a day or nothing, calling it volunteer work. Um, if they don't do this volunteer work, they're threatened with being put in solitary confinement or with being put in physical restraint. So it's really not volunteer work in, in any way. There's another detention center in Georgia where detainees are um, held in unsanitary, inhumane, and isolated conditions even when they are working. Uh, and they're forced to work full, full time for one to three dollars a day. Food is also scarce, so often workers will choose to work in the kitchen because it means that they have better access to food. Uh, and the ICE vendor contracts repeatedly cite voluntary work um, but there's no way that the prisoners can really say that they're not going to do this if they want to be fed or not be in solitary confinement. And really if they want to survive. The U.S. and its capitalist economy is at a dead end. One of the ways it manages to stay afloat is by expanding the number of super exploited workers that it has access to. So by building more prisons and more detention centers where workers, primarily people of color, are super exploited behind closed doors, or rather behind barbed wire. Detainees are fighting back. There's one example in the Northwest Detention Center, it's in Tacoma, Washington, where prisoners held seven hunger strikes last year in 2017. At one point, excuse me. At one point, there were 750 prisoners that were all striking at the same time. Um, there are so many stories to tell of families that are reunited, of prisoner solidarity, but also of guard brutality, of laws dictating that lawyers and other people coming into detention centers can't touch or hold crying babies or hug mothers, of starvation and of overwork, of exploitation. Um, but the prisoners are fighting, <laughs> and so are we, and they're not waiting for the legal system to make it easier for them, they're, they're taking it into their own hands. Um, because prisons and detention centers are really two sides of the same coin, I want to end with the chant of La migra, la policia, la misma porquería. Yeah. So, <laughs> if we can all do it together. La migra, la policia, la misma porquería. La migra, la policia, la misma porquería. Thank you.
Okay, so I'm just going to make some quick announcements before our last speaker. For those who came in a little later, just a reminder, we have the latest copies of our newspapers in the back, um, or by the elevator. They highlight that uh, there's going to be a Durham trip this weekend. Just also another announcement if anyone uh, can hop in a car tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. and isn't aware that they could go to Durham. Uh, someone should talk to someone in this room. Maybe Taryn or Christian. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, some comrades are going to Durham this weekend. Also, next weekend, um, February 25th, there is a public uh, screening of a documentary on Lorraine Hansberry. There's pamphlets, I think they also are by the tables in the back if anyone's interested in that. can also probably talk to, who could, who could someone talk to about that? Does anyone want to raise their hand to be a point person for that? No one? Well, you should go get a flyer then. Um, let's see, or just show up, just come. That's all you gotta know. Um, and I think there's one more announcement, let me double check. Oh, Working Class People's Day. Let me make sure I have all that information correct for y'all. Mm -hmm. It's also February 24th. Oh no, this is Sunday, so that Saturday is Working Class People's Day of Action. Um, in Foley Square. Does anyone, it's by an AFSCME coalition, it looks like, does anyone have any, any details they want to share about that? Anything else? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> uh, this is put on, uh, the, the Working People's Day is put on by AFSCME and a bunch of, um, it's actually a bunch of rallies being held all over the country in major cities. Uh, in um, in preparation for the Janus Supreme Court decision that's going to go down. Um, people are expecting something on that Monday, which is February 26th, or um, at least there's going to be some um, a hearing of some sort on that Monday. So that's really the reason why uh, all kinds of workers who are mainly unionized, but also non-unionized workers should come out as well on that Saturday at 11 a.m in Foley Square in New York City, and uh, you, there is a website for it, but I don't have it offhand, but you can Google uh, worker, Working People's Day, and you'll find all kinds of activities all over the country. Thanks. Awesome. So we have one more speaker tonight before our discussion. Uh, so our last and final speaker will be Renee Impart, uh, Imperto, sorry if I'm mispronouncing, who is going to give the final talk about the hardships of taxi drivers within the gig economy and how it connects to the suicide of the livery driver Douglas Shifter, if you haven't heard, who sort of who committed suicide in front of I think a city hall building, yeah, like last week. So give it up for Renee. Thank you. Yes, comrades and siblings, this is a report by the People's Metropolitan Trans Oh Portation. Uh, <laughs> Inject a little humor here. Um, so uh, I do want to announce just before I start that um, anyone who could make the next. Uh, MTA board meeting, which is Thursday, February 22nd at 9 a.m. at 2 Broadway. That's right where that bullshit bull statue is, you know, yeah. Um, and the woman confronting it, the young woman. Um, and also, uh, we have a flyer. If people could manage to get some of these flyers and distribute them, it would be good. <clears throat> now, um, I was asked to speak on the taxi perspective in relation to transportation workers. Whether you drive a bus, you work in the subway, you drive a taxi, your work is. So let me just say this. Um, I had a production meeting that uh, I do up at Sage on 27th Street. 
And just to give you an example of what disability access is like on buses for disabled people, be they use crutches, a wheelchair, um, and especially in the winter, it's almost a question of survival for disabled people, especially those who are using wheelchairs. Um, I'll give you a quick example. The two priority buses on 14th Street are the 14A and the 14D. The 14D runs in packs of three, not right next to each other, you know, like maybe five minutes apart. I never get on the first one. Once in a blue moon, or rarely, I get on the second one. Usually, it's the third one. So in other words, accessibility is not equal, which is what we want. Oh, by the way, tonight, I couldn't even get on the third one. I had to wait for the next cycle. And guess what? The first bus of the next cycle? Forget about it. <laughs> the second one, I managed to get on. So that was the fifth bus while I was in that bus stop. Can you imagine? Five. And of course, some of these buses are so crowded. Um, uh, the 14D, perhaps even more than the A. I might also point out that um, we've come up with this term about gentrifying public transportation. The 14th D, if I, had to, if I had to sum up the entire route, serves mostly people of color, people who live in projects, the oppressed, poor people, right? That service is not the same as those who are on the Upper East Side. I can tell you that right now. The question with dealing with disabled access is multi-layered. Um, I'll give you a few examples. You're in your wheelchair. It's 12 degrees outside. The wind is like yeah, 20 miles an hour, can be more. And the bus comes, there's no room. Even if you're in a wheelchair, the bus can be packed. I mean, literally like sardines. Now you wait for the next bus. Meanwhile, some vehicle or street work inhibits the bus from pulling over to the curb, lowering the ramp, and taking your wheelchair. Sometimes, you know what people in wheelchairs will actually do? If they can, they will actually take their chair to another bus stop where there isn't vehicles that, you know, pull over. Um, sometimes people in wheelchairs go out into the street, which is dangerous, just to get on a bus. If they don't get on a bus, and it's 11 degrees out, don't forget, you're sitting in the chair, you're not even moving around. You get colder way faster than able-bodied people. I just wanted to point that out. Now, let's talk about the taxi industry. Now, I started driving a taxi for 26 years in 1972. Um, at that time, we actually had a union that had eyeglass plan, vacation plan, and whatnot. Until the union, until the industry, rather, slipped into um, serfdom, okay? That's basically what happened, where workers now had to pay to rent their cab. Involuntary service basically. When that happened, uh, the industry became more desperate. At that point, until 2004 or 5, there were 12,800 taxis in New York City. 
Unfortunately, many of those taxis did not serve oppressed communities. They did not. It's just an unfortunate truth. Of course, now that probably, well, certainly at least 90% of the taxi driver workforce are people of color. Most, and, me, and, mo, and many, mostly of them, immigrants. Most taxi drivers do a 14-hour day. They basically work two seven-hour shifts. You go to your garage, you throw in your hack license, usually you're going to shape up at least an hour. Couple that with now having to turn in, you have to go through a whole process. Basically, it's a 14-hour day. So people say, well, why are you working 12 hours? Well, because you're not being paid by percentage of your trips anymore, right? You're not going out and getting a $10 fare and you make $5 for yourself on your first fare. You have to take in $130, $140 before you make a dime for yourself. The fleet owners love it. Guaranteed profit. They know exactly what they're going to make. Macy's department store doesn't even know what profit they're going to make tonight. Um, so, so what has happened that has now perpetuated into another problem? Massive layoffs that have been going on for years. Workers have become unemployed. They've been attracted to things like Uber or Lyft. And it's very understandable. I also might add, though, that in the outlying districts, East New York, Crown Heights, Bed-Stuy, Bushwick, people of color are actually getting served. This has to be conceded. I mean, this has to be said. In Manhattan, it's a different story. Here's the deal. In 2005, Bloomberg increased 1,200 medallions to, uh, from 12,600 approximately to 13,800. Uh, that's a way of the city generating revenue. Um, and then, as we all know, approximately four years ago, Uber and Lyft came onto the scene. The last thing we want to see is workers at each other's throat. Mm -hmm. Uber has tried to undercut the taxi industry by having lower prices. Now. Mm -hmm. Now. <laughs> um, except when there was, remember the explosion over here in Chelsea? Mm -hmm. What was that, last year sometime? Right after that, Uber doubled the rates in this area, immediately. Talk about exploitation. So now if you take, um, okay, let me also point this out to you for your benefit. Mo all Ubers and Lyfts and other ones like it, I don't know the names of all of them, but those are the two main ones, they all have at the end of their license plate a C. Mm -hmm. Taxis don't have it. They have T's. Now, the C's used to be for car services and maybe, you know, black cars, right? Which all are becoming diminished because of the competition from Uber. But the Uber and Lyft drivers are basically at each other's throats. Why? I'll tell you why. There's periods of time, like in the late 80s, when I can tell you that there was probably one taxi for every three fares. So, you know, you went out, you made your money. Now, if you count taxis, Uber, Lyft, you're probably talking about a dozen cars for one fare. All right? What does that mean? <laughs> it means that Uber, 
really exploits these people because they're so desperate for any fair that comes along. Um, and uh, of course, you know, the only, the only big difference between uh, a, a, a yellow taxi driver and an Uber and a Lyft is, and I don't mean this to be insulting, please understand. Uh, taxi drivers do have to go through orientation, you have to take courses, uh, you know, at, at least to get you started. While Ubers are unregulated, well, some workers would say amateurs. Yeah. Um, I, I don't mean that in a desecrating way. Um, so what has happened is this. If you take taxi, Uber, Lyft, and combine them with taxis, it's not 13,800. It's more like now 119,000. Okay? So there's way more wheels for the fares that want the wheels. This has led to a decline in wages for all the workers. Taxi, Uber, Lyft, it doesn't matter. I myself know taxi drivers working tonight. You know where they go home? You know where their home is? It's the back seat of the cab. They got their toothpaste and their clothes in the trunk. That's how bad it's gotten. People have lost their homes. Seriously. And many have actually, if they're not homeless, they're on the edge of homelessness. And there is no, uh, there's no regulation of it. it. It's really taking workers and put them in such a state of desperation that they work sometimes even longer hours. I know taxi drivers, you know what they do? They work double shifts. Not every day, but they work double shifts. They work easily over 100 hours a week. By the way, a double in the taxi industry is 24 hours. Just imagine a shift like that. So, what is really needed is a protracted, organized, comprehensive movement to fight the MTA and, uh, how should I call it, the authority figures of transportation, <laughs> the bosses. So, if I can just add this, um, we went last night to this uh, MTA thing at uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, where they're very skillful. They have these, uh, they have like, I don't know how many people they have, but like maybe 25 people who are constantly rotating in front of a... Uh, diagram of some kind. And I can tell you, most of it is absolutely ludicrous. Like, two-way bike lanes right alongside each other on a one-way street. Now, I used to work in the bicycle industry as well. I was a bike leader for American Youth Hostels. I rode about 10 to 11,000 miles a year before I was no longer able to. Right? That's that's how much I, 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 uh, I uh, rode a bike. And now, what, what you have is uh, a situation where they are creating, let me just say this to you, I can't listen, I don't have the time to go into it all. This L train shutdown, which frankly I believe is a prerequisite, what they want to do is standard operational procedure condition people to believe there is no alternative and that this advisory, I forget their name, maybe somebody could correct me. They come out about every 25 years with a proposal. And the last one which they came out with about 11 days ago was the idea of shutting down mass transit completely from midnight to 5 a.m., right? And they're using this L-line shutdown, which 
no one can convince us has to be completely shut down. I mean, remember, they're talking about Hurricane Sandy. And they're talking about this project being completed by 2022. Isn't that 10 years after Sandy? Mm -hmm. Well, how did they manage all these years? Mm -hmm. Now, what it tells you is that at the very least we would give them is that they could stagger the trains. It is going to be literally a nightmare even getting here to a meeting. Um, no private cars on 14th Street. Parking, forget about it. And let me say one last thing about um, shutting down the subways and buses 12 to 5. Do I hear layoffs of transit workers if you eliminate five hours of operation? Wouldn't it, you reasonably conclude that that would be one of their results and the objectives, in fact? So, let's just say that the work of PMTA, which we're not even that old. I mean, we, when we started, like in the summer, um, is getting a reputation. We did a mic check at that meeting last night. Well, not a meeting. The reason why they have it is so that you can't dominate the meeting by like going there with a loudspeaker. We did a mic check, but basically by, by, and they've done this in Brooklyn too, they divide up so that you have a handful of people here, a handful of people there, and there's no connection. Um, so, uh, well maybe like, maybe let me just leave it at that um, and remind people, we do have this leaflet, we have the um, we have the MTA board meeting Thursday, February twenty second at nine a.m. and there's the court. We have a the, support the law lawsuit to get elevators in the subway station, as directed by the Americans with Disabilities Act, which, as many of you know, is over a quarter of a century old. And then, oh, that's Monday, March 5th at 10 a.m. at 60 Center Street. And put your antenna up for the People's MTA meeting right here, Wednesday, March 7th at 7 p.m. on this floor. Thank you. Before or a forum before, we do pass around a donation bucket um, to sort of help us out with costs and funding. But tonight, I'm actually going to have Rosa Marie come up and talk a little bit about something, a uh, different kind of cause that we can donate for, sort of ties in with our message. Um, and once she uh, gives her information, we'll pass the bucket around. And while the bucket is going around, we're going to watch a great video. If you haven't seen it, her comrade Deirdre. Uh, Dragging Tucker Carlson's ass on live television. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I just want to add a little bit of information to your report because I mostly write the two and the five, and the five has been shut down at 11 for many years. So if I stay later than 11, it takes me two hours, two and a half hours to get home. And now, it's being shut that both the five and the two are being shut down even earlier. So if I'm, uh, depends on what station you get on, it can be as early as 8.30. So a higher up is later and later. But anyway, I just wanted to add that piece of information. I thoroughly agree with you, they're conditioning us, and it cramps my style. I'm a tiny person. <laughs> so anyway, the reason, uh, the primary reason that I'm up here is to let you know one that I've been working with various uh, Mexican groups in the city in reference to the Marichui campaign 
she's an indigenous woman that's being uh, run uh, for president in Mexico by the Zapatista movement, uh, directly with the um, indigenous Congress, National Congress, and the SIG, which is the Committee of Indigenous uh, Governments, referring to the Indi autonomous uh, indigenous governments. So um, last night we had an activity in front of the Museum of Natural History. And while we were there, we got a message from Baja California uh, telling us that the vans had suffered a horrible accident. Uh, January 20th, we had uh, delegates here. One of the, Francisco was one of the delegates. He's in great condition. Marichui broke an arm. One of the members of the supporters network died. And there are a number, like five to eight people with uh, various injuries, but minor injuries. The major injuries, what well, the major thing is the person that died in, in Marichu in Francisco, who is very, very serious condition. We don't know what's going to happen with him. So that's why we are asking that this donation be for that purpose, mm -hmm. because they are additionists and they are autonomous, and the, the poor, they really need it. Thank you very much. Thank you um, so much for all your donations. And just a reminder that you can um, donate uh, through a pledge. There are pledge slips that you can fill out, um, and you can give them to Marsha or Ellen. Um, and yeah, thank you for all your donations. If you have any more questions about donations, you can talk to Marsha or Ellen or Christian or myself. Yes. The video, yeah. Let's watch this great video. Jennifer Biswald is editor of Workers' World. It's a weekly communist newspaper that supports the North Korean regime, where she has visited, and she joins us tonight. Jennifer, thanks for coming on. Hello. So, um, you, you're a longtime communist. You're a longtime supporter of the VPRK. You visited at the invitation of the government. You think its leaders are great. When you see CNN and Reuters agreeing with you that its leaders are great, that, that must validate you. I mean, you must cheer as you watch the Olympic coverage. I've been to both North Korea and South Korea, mm -hmm. and I'm on this program because I want to talk to the people who watch your show and make a serious point yes. that we're in the process of moving towards a nuclear war. And uh -huh. they, they have never experienced that, but the Korean people know very much what war is like, and they're not for it. And the people of South Korea don't want war any more than the people of North Korea do. And they showed that at the Olympics, when the, right. in the opening ceremonies, when they cheered with great joy the fact that the North and the South were marching together. So since you've been to both countries, I'm just wondering, so one is obviously the world's last Stalinist regime. It's pretty rigidly Marxist. That's North Korea. South Korea is floridly capitalist. It's a market-based economy, uh, which, of course, you reject. Which country would you rather live in personally? I won't uh, try to answer and debate you on everything you've said. Well, no, no, I'm not debating it. No, no, that's a sincere, well, that's I a sincere question. I only have a couple of minutes, but, uh, <laughs> but what I want to talk about... You're not going to answer the question? What I, what I want to talk about is uh -huh. what I think is really of, of importance to the people of this country. That is that there's a group in Washington that really wants to push for a war. The Korean yeah. people don't want it. People here don't want a war, but they don't know what a war is like. They think you just push a button somewhere. Well, but, That's but, not well, true. Well, 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 let me just say that I, I've never said this to a communist before, but I actually agree with you. I, I don't want a war in Good. Korea, and I think there are people in Washington who are pushing for it. I think you're absolutely right there. Mm -hmm. I guess where I disagree with you is we don't know what the people of North Korea want because they're not allowed to say what they want. Oh, and, and I'm a little... Well, <laughs> really? So I, I, do they have internet access there? Oh, they don't? I, okay. I do they, they know right, what's they going have. on in the world. They know right. perfectly well what's going on in the world. How would they know? Because it's illegal to watch a foreign movie there, no, so how would they making, know? You're making up a lot of stuff. The is people of North Korea is, are very aware of what's going on in the world. North Korea has a 100% literacy rate. Did you know that? I, I got did, that yeah. figure. I got that figure from the CIA fact book. Well, I, I've I seen it as well. It but if you can't read anything but the propaganda... Care, of, they are not in some kind of a you know, jail. They're not. They are, really? they are people who want to 
Get, get out from underneath the threat of war that the U.S. has posed ever since it, it invaded their country in 1950. Okay, now, I, I know you don't want to debate by what you mean. You don't want to yeah. answer real questions, but let's just try a couple of them. If they're free, why can't they leave? Uh, look, people, That's a fair question. Go back and forth. people go back and forth. Uh, I, you know, you, you're taking this whole in, in, in a whole other direction that shouldn't be of any significance to people here. Do, why do wait, 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 wait,
almost 3 million people, yeah. and say something in defense of Korea at a time like this, then I, think, I thought it was the right thing to do it. Yes. So, you know, well, most of the people who watch that show are crap. We don't, you know, we don't expect to change their minds. But, you know, like people just leave their TV on, or maybe they just are sitting in a bar somewhere or a right. restaurant somewhere, yeah. and it's on. And if we can reach them with a message against this rotten imperialist government that's actually working out plans for an attack, we've got to do it. Right. That's it. Thank you.